So, as most of you probably already know, this week marks the 30th anniversary of the launch of the Roland D50. And as it is one of the few vintage synthesizers from the 80s that I own and sort of like, um, I thought I'd do a quick piece on it. I should mention that I was 10 going on 11 in 1987 when it came out, so I certainly didn't have one to begin with. When I started my uh, professional composing career almost 20 years ago, uh, the first major workhorse synth I had was the JV1080, which had a lot of sounds from the D50 in it, but somehow um, never sounded quite the same, I always felt. So I always wanted one, and then um, a couple of years ago, at the end of 2015, I was lucky enough to find one being sold for a really, really good price on Ricardo, that's the Swiss eBay. Uh, there was no photos of the unit and I went along uh, and to my pleasant surprise not only was the unit in really really good condition, it had one owner who would bought it from new and in fact it still has the little um, music store sticker on the back of it. Not only did he have the unit but he also had the PG-1000 programmer which he hadn't even mentioned in the ad and when I turned up and asked him about it, he said, oh yeah, I forgot to put it in the ad, uh, you can have that as well if you want. Uh, and for that, he even actually had the original box, which, not that I'm fussy about these sort of things, but it shows you what sort of condition uh, and how well they've been looked after. It got used a hell of a lot on my album Fictions. It's got a certain, well, I think it's pretty obvious that it's got a certain obviously 80s iconic sound. It doesn't really sound like other synths from the 80s. There's been a lot mentioned on the um, YouTube videos from Roland about how revolutionary it was and uh, the fact that it had processing and stuff. I must say, the processing, that's a fair point. The, the processing really does make a difference. Um, you can take, uh, the, the reverb isn't just um, a whole reverb or whatever. It's a bunch of different reverbs, including gated reverb, sort of large cavernous stuff and whatever. And if you just set up a simple preset like one of the marimba ones and then switch through the reverbs, you'll see very quickly how, um, how much of a difference that makes to the sound. Um, one thing I should say about the presets actually is that um, yes they get a lot of flack because they are you know they were overused and everything as with all presets they're off their time so obviously at that point creating realistic instruments um, was something unheard of unless you had a Fairlight or a Synclavier so Obviously, they wanted to show that off. It's important to note that you can switch off the PCM part of it completely and have quite a versatile four-voice digital synth. And when I say four-voice, I mean proper four-voice with a filter and an envelope and LFO settings per voice. Um, it even does pulse width modulation, so Nick Bat will be pleased. Um, so, this is my unit here. Obviously I've got the PG-1000. I would like to dispel one myth that seems to be in all the Roland videos that it's easy to program. I would like to state for the record right now, that is bollocks. Even with the PG-1000. Um, the myth that this makes this easier to program is not, is not really is a myth. The reason being is the display at the top of the PG-1000 is an even smaller two-line display than this one. It's not one slider per function, it's actually per two functions. So depending on whether you're in the common parameter mode, which is the lower and the upper tones, or whether you're in partial mode, the buttons have a different function. And anybody who's ever tried to program with the PG-1000 will tell you of the wonderful time they've had where they thought they were adjusting the amplitude envelope, but actually had it 
on the common setting and were really adjusting the pitch envelope or thought they were adjusting the filter cutoff and actually they were adjusting the structure and suddenly changed the entire bloody sound. It's also important to point out the stuff sent out from the PG-1000 is actually MIDI SysX. So it's not real-time control. You have to adjust the controller, then touch key to be able to hear the difference you've made. Roland could have made their life and their, and their customers' lives a lot easier had they given the ability to have the, the lower and upper tone layer patches taken from a common pool as opposed to being stored individually per patch. That would have meant you could have browsed through the different options of lower or upper tones Something that I used to do a little bit with the JV1080 when I first got it, and I wasn't programming from scratch. I might add that it is impossible to initialize a complete patch. You have to initialize each partial, so that's the lowest level of programming individually. Yeah. So I think we get why this is difficult. On the plus side, unlike the DX7, it is subtractive, so the voice structure, whether you're using the uh, PCMs or the just the built-in digital synthesis, is relatively straightforward to understand. They've got the, the time variable envelopes and the time variable filters, which they later included on the JV1080, and I always felt was a level of complexity that was really, frankly, rather unnecessary. Um, I get that there are people out there who want to create enormously complex patches where stuff starts at different levels and where you take things, you know, I think where different stuff starts at different times. Um, personally, and this is coming from somebody who uses modular synthesis, the amount of times you're actually going to use those sort of envelopes and where you would rather just have a basic ADSR style envelope are oh, relatively few and far between. That's the negative side of that. What's the plus side? The plus side is it does actually sound really good. I'm going to stick my neck out and say that of all the obvious 80s digital synths, the DX7, the Fairlight, um, the M1, this holds up the best. The reason being is because of the way it uses PCMs and digital synthesis, because it actually has, it's essentially a subtractive synthesizer, it has filters, it's more versatile than any of the rest of those synths. For instance, you can do a reasonable impression of an FM based synth patch with this. also do a reasonable impression of the Fairlight Husky Voices stuff. It will even, and this is going to be probably the most controversial statement I will make, it will even do something that sounds, at least to my ears, like late Oberheim, late sequential circuits style synths. And plus, like all the 80s stuff, 
the M1, the DX7, there are a multitude of online patch packs for this. It's a, uh, if you like 80s style synth stuff, which obviously is a taste thing, then there's lots here that you can find to like. And I'm really interested to see that they've reproduced it in a boutique synth. I'm curious to see what new sort of patches people have done with it, modern patches, because I genuinely believe the presets don't necessarily show off the best features of this. Um, it really excels in pads and synthetic key sounds and ambient stuff. You can do basses and stuff as well. The low end is surprisingly good. That myth that um, digital synthesizers don't have a decent low end is not true in this case.